Welcome back to Illinois Lawmakers continuing coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly. I'm Jack Titchener along with Rich Miller of Capital Facts. Good to have you here, sir. Good to be here. We're, we're talking around midday on Thursday, about 36 hours before the scheduled adjournment of the spring session of the General Assembly. Uh, all eyes are kind of focused right now on the uh, final draft of the new budget that takes effect on uh, July 1 for the new fiscal year. What's the progress? Um, pretty good so far. Uh, you know, you have the, the House uh, is uh, putting together its own budget, kind of like to lay down a marker. The Senate has um, uh, its own language that they want to use. Um, but from what I can gather, and that could change because it's only, you know, midday on Thursday and they're scheduled to adjourn on Friday. But I mean, we could even see a budget today on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Um, it's possible, which would be ridiculously early. Um, it's been a strange session, Jack. It's it's not like covering usual sessions. Now we're gonna see, again, mm -hmm. things can break down. Things can always break down. Um, but I mean, everybody involved is, you know, credibly claiming that they're negotiating in good faith and they're trying to get this done. I, I talked with uh, House Majority Leader Greg Harris a, a little earlier, uh, and he says he believes it's entirely possible that the House and Senate uh, Democratic versions of the budget can be uh, reconciled uh, pretty shortly. Yeah, like today, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It's bizarre. When have you ever seen that before, Jack? You've been doing this how long? Uh, 30 years. <laughs> yeah, me too. Like 32 years. It's, uh, it's, well, it's easy to put together a budget when you got so much money laying around. Well, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not uh, sniffling or sniffing, sniffing around the, the margins as we've had to do uh, for so many years. Well, usually, I mean, you know, they're trying to stretch every last penny to get something out of it because there's hardly any money available to spend. Uh, the problem now is convincing people not to spend the extra money that they have. Just set it aside for a rainy day. Set it aside because revenues are going to start declining, right? Um, and the state has to be ready for that. And that's what this budget is about because revenues will are, are will decline. How close uh, are the two super majorities in the House and Senate to getting this thing done? They But they've both rolled out, as you said, their own budget initiatives and there's uh, several hundred million dollars uh, between the two in terms of a difference uh, to get hammered out here in the last few hours. Yeah, it can be. I mean, some of this is fundamental, right? Um, but is it fundamental to stop them from getting finished? No, I don't think so. It's not so ideologically or, or politically entrenched that they can't figure a way to split the difference, so to speak. And that's what the House budget really, uh, their proposal really does. The governor proposed, for instance, a billion dollars in tax breaks, temporary tax breaks. Uh, the Senate had proposed about a billion eight. Uh, the House comes out with a billion three, billion four, whatever, somewhere in there, literally splitting the difference between the two. Um, so, uh, you know, you figure they'll split the difference again between the House version and the Senate version. And, you know, that's not all that difficult to do, I don't think. But we'll see. Yep. Again, they've been working together pretty well, um, surprisingly so. You know, there was a lot of tension last year between the House and the Senate and between the governor's office and the Senate. Uh, and there, there was some, you know, several days ago, but I, I don't detect that now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, that I don't sense that there's uh, that much daylight between the two super majorities. Uh, in the last half minute or so, we have your... <laughs> yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's always a possibility. Where, where are the Republicans in this in the last half minute or so? Uh, they're on the sidelines. They've chosen to be on the sidelines. Uh, they've been forced to the sidelines at the same time. Um, they don't, this would be a, a really good budget year for them to be participating, but politically it's, uh, it's just not in the cards. 
Rich, you've been watching the whole thing uh, uh, run its course over the last 30 years or so, the two of us have. And it's, it's really interesting in this session to see how Speaker Welch has advanced his agenda with the Illinois House. And it's a widely diverse uh, group of lawmakers. Uh, right. So in the past, it, um, if you were a member uh, uh, under Speaker Madigan, you would have to go to him and he would have to, or his office would then approve whatever you wanted to get done. And that required whatever, right, uh, in return. Mm -hmm. Now it's much more member driven. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it is significantly more member uh, and caucus, sub-caucus driven than it, than it was in the past. And I, I find that to be refreshing. And then, by the way, that's in both chambers now. Um, uh, more and uh, more so in the past, the members have more control over things like the budget, things like tax cuts, things like the crime, you know, the criminal justice bills or the crime bill, the anti crime bills. Um, there's just a lot more involvement, and um, they're going to, they're, it's like being in the balcony, Jack. They're going in the session while we're talking. I got it up on my computer. I <laughs> well, and, and you're, you're, you were mentioning that. Uh, it's like, uh, like old times. Oh, that sounds like a plan. Um, as you were saying, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a different uh, kind of uh, atmosphere as opposed to the top-down management, management style that um, uh, Speaker Madigan had. But Welch seems to be able to round up everybody at the end of the day and get them pretty close to being on the same page. Um, yeah, uh, that, that is very true. I, I would agree with that. He, he, he's just, I mean, he's doing a pretty good job. He, considering he'd never, you know, I mean, it, it just, nobody thought that he would be speaker, right? Necessarily. Um, and he kind of just jumped into it. Um, I, I think he's doing a, a, a fairly good job uh, of, of, of hurting the, the uh, kindergartners. Um, you mentioned a little earlier that the, uh, the, the same kind of situations kind of plan itself uh, out in the Senate under President Don Harmon. Uh, there have been some splinters here and there, some daylight between them on some things, but at the end of the day, they seem to be able to, to get back uh, on the same, uh, same page in the agenda. Um, and I think part of that is because they've devolved some of their authority down to their members. Mm -hmm. So it's not just two personalities uh, uh, going at it, or three when you include the governor. Um, they're representative of their caucuses uh, more than than in the past. Was it, mm -hmm. you know, the leader's personal opinion about what is going to happen with this budget or with this session or with this particular omnibus bill? It's more of uh, the representing their caucuses' interests, and yeah, that's uh, that's a, a healthier way of going about this. Rich Miller, thank you so much. We appreciate it, sir, as always. Thank you. Up next on Illinois Lawmakers, we're joined by Democratic House Majority Leader Greg Harris of Chicago. Thanks for taking the time out, Leader, in uh, the last hours of the spring session of the General Assembly. The big news this week, of course, is the House has put its uh, budget outline out there for everyone to consider. What are the highlights in that package, sir? I think the highlights are, first off, you know, Illinois has done pretty well in recovery from COVID. You know, we, we, we've seen things really turning around, but we also know that, you know, some people in Illinois have recovered faster and some people are still struggling. So we're going to be putting a uh, tax relief program for Illinois families into place that will return $1.4 billion to you know, Illinois families, focusing on those with the highest needs. How closely does this proposal mirror what Governor Pritzker put out back at the first part of February? And how does it stack up with what Senate Democrats have put on the table? Uh, as, as we speak today, those are being merged together, those three different programs. So we're, I, I think a lot of you're going to see a lot of similarities, but our key emphasis is putting in property tax relief, putting in inflation relief, 
and returning about a billion and a half, a billion four dollars to uh, our, our families across the state. Um, there's a lot of uh, tax relief built into this package. Uh, there's uh, gas tax relief, there's grocery tax relief, property tax relief. And also we're looking at expanding the earned income tax credit so that families who are you know, at, at the lower ends of the wage scale get maximum benefit from this. We wanna be sure that you know, we direct as much relief to families who are, who are really struggling uh, as we can. Uh, how would that play out uh, in the house package for uh, uh, lower income uh, folks who, who need this kind of tax relief? Well, we're gonna base it on the earned income tax credit. This is something that already exists both at the federal and state level, but we're going to expand it we want to add you know, additional children's uh, tax credits to it. So there'll be a number of expansions to help people out. Uh, what's this uh, clock in at in terms of the overall impact on the budget overall? Like I said, it's going to be about a billion four, about mm -hmm. a billion four. Um, how are talks going between Speaker Welch and uh, Senate President Harmon on reconciling what the Senate's put forth and what the House has put forth? Oh, they're going real well. And on the expense side too, of how we you know, appropriate money for the other operations of the state, I think Senate Democrats and House Democrats are on the same page. You know, we wanna be sure that we're adding money to the state share of education funding so that we can reduce local reliance of school districts on property taxes. And we want to improve you know, access to healthcare. We know there's just you know, a crying need across the state. There are tens of thousands of you know, backlogged appointments of people waiting for mental health care or substance abuse treatment in communities. And that has just shot up during COVID. So we're putting $170 million in to allow workforce expansions in every city and town so that you know, mental health services can be provided. Uh, we're adding money, 5% uh, to grow our colleges and universities. And we're going to allow about 24,000 more uh, Illinois families to get MAP grants for their students who wish to go to college. Yeah, that's a that's a crucial one for higher education. There was some pushback earlier from the uh, trade unions about the gasoline tax. How how has that panned out? Well, and that was really a sort of behind the scenes, you know, inside baseball discussion of you know what the mechanism of how you pay for it is. So I think those are all getting worked out. That that that's a technical issue. Um, the House version, as I understand it, uh, puts another $100 million into the local government distributed fund. That's the, uh, the way that the state takes income taxes and uh, pours some of that back into municipal governments. Sure. Uh, and House members have been you know, really insistent that we need to do, send uh, some more back to the locals to help relieve some of their costs related to COVID, to, you know, for more police protection, more fire protection, those kind of things. So, you know, we're hoping we can include that in our plan as well. Uh, looks like you're going to get this all done by uh, the end of business tomorrow. Um, I ho hopefully and hopefully before midnight so that, you know, we can all go home and get a good night's rest because it'd be a long night tonight too. Um, Leader, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. More on the budget now with Deputy House Republican Leader Tom Demmer of Dixon. Good to have you with us, Leader. And I know this is an extremely busy day as we're counting down the hours to, to adjournment. Um, the, uh, the Democrats have put their budget out there in the House. There's a competing version on the Senate Democrats side. Where is all this uh, uh, shaking out in your view? Well, I think it's still developing, too. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, a couple versions of the budget be introduced in the House. I'm not sure we've seen the final version uh, be introduced yet. But uh, about uh, 36 hours ago, we saw for the first time as House Republicans a 3,600 page budget. So our uh, appropriations team went into uh, full discovery mode and, and tried to understand exactly what was in that budget proposal. But as you mentioned, this is a really busy day and, and uh, I think things are still evolving on what we're actually going to see as a full uh, budget this year. So this is basically uh, very close, at least in terms of what the Democratic majorities are putting out. It's very close to what Governor Pritzker outlined on February 2nd in his uh, budget and State of the State address, uh, about a $45 billion budget. Uh, there's tax relief in there to the tune of around 
a billion dollars on groceries, gasoline taxes, some property tax uh, rebates. Um, how does that square with what you would like to do with the budget? Well, first, I think it's important that we address uh, some of the burdens that Illinois families are feeling. So some of those tax relief uh, proposals are in line with what House Republicans have been advocating for a long time. And frankly, I'm glad to hear that the Democrats in the legislature are starting to acknowledge that the high taxes in Illinois are a burden on Illinois families. Uh, we'd like to see some of these programs be um, uh, maybe a little bit more long term or sustainable. Uh, some of the proposals that we've seen so far, you know, it's for a six month delay in, in you know, uh, implementation of a tax or, you know, a temporary 1% reduction. Uh, you know, some of those you, you have to ask a little question about whether Illinois families or consumers would even notice that uh, when they went to, you know, buy their groceries. Are they going to notice that there's not a 1% uh, sales tax added to it? Uh, you know, we've been advocating for some more significant relief uh, to deliver to Illinois families. But, you know, frankly, I think it's a, a good thing that for once Springfield's looking to say, what can we do to provide some kind of tax relief? And we're in a different situation than we have been in years past. During much of your tenure, um, it, it's been a, a real exercise in trying to fund state uh, agencies at the proper level. And to be able to actually do some tax relief is something kind of remarkable in recent Illinois history. It is. And I think, you know, one of the other things we have to be cognizant of is we've had bad budget years uh, throughout much of our recent history, really challenging budget years. Uh, we should be really careful about how we're making spending plans right now, what we're, what we're building into our normal operating uh, base spending plan uh, versus, you know, doing some things that are uh, retiring some debts or, you know, addressing some some one time concerns. Um, some of the spending increases in this budget, it, we're growing those spending plans faster than our revenues are coming in. And so you're setting yourself up in a year where we uh, maybe have a little bit of an economic downturn. Uh, maybe tax revenues don't come in as strong as what we projected. We have to be really careful that we're not setting ourselves up to uh, come up to the edge of a new cliff. So this is this is what you're talking about. This is uh, what we always call the out years. Uh, you build in stuff into the base of the budget, and then who knows what happens a few years from now. That's exactly right, and and that's something we have to be really careful about. Um, you know, we're seeing better than expected revenues right now. Add to that this avalanche of federal cash that came to the state over the last couple of years as one-time infusion for COVID relief. Uh, we need to be really careful that we're not building an expectation or an assumption into the budget that those kinds of things are going to continue because they're not. <laughs> the, the federal cash is certainly limited. And we know that just in the normal economy, there are uh, good years and bad years. There are high revenue years and low revenue years. So we need to be really cautious about that. We got about half a minute left, uh, Leader uh, Demmer. Uh, both the House and the Senate Democrats have an idea about uh, change, uh, setting up uh, an earned income tax credit for lower income uh, residents of Illinois. Uh, how does that square with with your view of the budget? Well, I've been an advocate of the earned income tax credit for several years and have signed on as a co-sponsor to many of those initiatives. I think it is a really good way to deliver meaningful relief to some of the lowest income, lowest earning families in the state of Illinois. And, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that as one of the items that's being considered. Leader Tom Demmer, thank you so much for taking the time out on a, a, an extremely busy day. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Fresh from the Senate floor on third readings is uh, Senator uh, Julie Morrison, Democrat of Deerfield, who chairs the Senate Health Committee. She also serves as a Senate Majority Whip. Good to have you here. And I know this is an extremely busy time of the year for you. Well, thanks for asking me to be on with you for a few minutes. Um, Senator, just before sitting down to talk, I, I was reading uh, an article by Capital News Illinois about the death of an eight-year-old uh, uh, youngster in the Peoria area who died while his case was being handled by the Department of Children and Family Services. And um, the story went on to say that we've had at least five children die under DCFS, uh, uh, DCFS watches here in, in the last uh, several months. It always seems to be that when we sit down to talk about the agency, there's a tragedy like this to report. You know, DCFS is probably 
the most difficult agency to talk about because uh, it's, it deals specifically with families and children that are in trouble or at risk. And so even just this week, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, both the governor's office, the um, DCFS administration, and several of my colleagues who are also uh, really concerned about the fact that yet another child has died uh, while an investigation was pending. And this this is not new. This is this goes back some thirty some odd years that uh, the agency has been chronically underfunded. The uh, case loads have been extremely high, and unfortunately, from time to time, children fall through the cracks. What is the uh, Pritzker administration and the Senate Democrats hoping to do in this session of the General Assembly to try and turn the agency around? Well, I can tell you that the budget that the governor presented and that I believe will be passed for DCFS has sufficient funding to bring in more and very needed caseworkers and investigators. The, the case level that these folks have in DCFS is uh, way too high and not in compliance with some of the consent decrees. So we know that that is a big issue. Um, one of the issues too that just happened not too long ago in central Illinois was the death of an investigator at a home where there was a child she was investigating. And the whole idea of providing greater safety for those investigators who walk into homes um, with the intention sometime of maybe having to remove a child, asking someone to go into that very dangerous situation, uh, we have got to do a better job of preparing the caseworker both through better training and perhaps having tools and resources with them that they don't have now. Um, DCFS, I met with them this morning, they actually do have a series of pilot programs that they are trying around the state to see what is most effective. Um, a buddy system, uh, contracting with local law enforcement to sort of be on call and be there uh, should somebody need should an investigator need someone immediately? Um, various ways of um, texting or panic buttons to call for additional help, a buddy system. So there are lots of different things that are being looked at, but I think we recognize we cannot recruit and keep good investigators when it's not a safe situation. I, I completely agree that was a terrible situation that, uh, that she encountered there. Uh, the governor's proposed budget as I read it, says there's something like a quarter of a billion dollars in new funding for DCFS overall, uh, nearly a hundred million dollars to help community-based providers, uh, which is how a lot of the agency's uh, services are actually delivered. That's right. Um, once a, when a child goes into foster care or when a family receives intact services, they go to services within their community. They're going to be closest and best able, hopefully, to meet with that family and child and to reunify if that's the appropriate goal. We need to do a better job of building up the community resources. And I'm hoping that this funding will be a step in the right direction. There's another uh, $15, billion, or $15 million with an M uh, to hire an additional 360 employees to deal with the growing caseloads. It, we need, as I think I mentioned, you know, the caseloads are much too high for the investigators and the case managers, especially the intact families, which is something I've looked at for several years. An intact family is one where an investigator has gone in, found um, a very serious allegation has been proven. They choose not to remove the child, but instead offer services to the family, trying to keep the family intact, which is always best, we hope, for the child, unless it's extraordinarily dangerous. It's those intact families that we know have a positive finding for abuse or neglect that need to have eyes on them much more often than we are. And it's something that I continually ask for and uh, request funding about. As we, as we wrap up here, we're uh, just about out of time. Are you confident that the um, extra funds and the extra oversight that's being provided in 
this new budget will help turn the agency around? You know, I'd like to tell you I am, but I'm not. Um, it requires more than just money. It's going to require consistency. It's going to require um, better coordination with the Department of Human Services and with the Department of Public Health. DCFS can't operate in a vacuum by itself. And it also needs to work with our educational system. All the different facets of our community and resources that touch that child and that family. So while I think uh, dollars will certainly improve and help, that's not gonna be the only answer. A more holistic approach, no doubt. Senator Morrison, Senator Morrison, thank you so much for taking time on a very busy, busy day. My pleasure, thank you.